burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? Hello, gentle listener, and welcome to Nocturnal Transmissions, the fortnightly podcast that brings you dark tales, both old and new, performed by voice artist Kristen Holland. Gentle listener, at last the day has arrived. The Nocturnal Transmissions Legal Department have been poring over contracts, negotiating furiously, and initiating hostile takeovers, all to secure the rights to bring you this much-lauded tale. Our humble narrator absolutely adores this extraordinary piece of prose and would like to extend his personal thanks to the author Rajesh Parameswaran for his assistance and encouragement in our mission to bring this wonderful, wonderful story to you, our beloved listeners. A gentleman and a scholar indeed. The story in question appears in his inaugural collection of short stories, I Am an Executioner. I strongly recommend you seek it out, gentle listener. More on that later. Now, without further ado, Nocturnal Transmissions is proud to present the infamous Bengal Ming. From I Am an Executioner by Rajesh Parameswaran, published by Vintage Books, an imprint of the Knopf Doubleday Publishing Group, a division of Penguin Random House, LLC, copyright 2012 by Rajesh Parameswaran. The one clear thing I can say about Wednesday, the worst and most amazing day of my life, is this. It started out beautifully. I woke up with the summer dawn, when the sky goes indigo grey, and the air's empty coolness begins to fill with a tacky enveloping warmth. I could hear Saskia and Maharaj purring to each other at the far end of my compound. I'd had to listen to their cooing and screeching sex noises all night, but it didn't bother me. I didn't know why yet, but I realised I was over it. Saskia could sleep with every tiger in the world but me, and I wouldn't mind. I stretched and smacked my mouth and licked my lips, tasting the familiar odours of the day. Already I somehow sensed that this morning would be different from all the other mornings of my life. On the far side of the wall hippos mucked and splashed, and off in the distance the monkeys and birds who had been up since pre-dawn darkness started their morning chorus in earnest. Their caws and key keys and karoo karoo karoos echoing out over the breadth of our little kingdom. These were the same sounds I heard morning after morning, but this morning it was all more beautiful than ever. Yes, this morning was different. It took me a little while to puzzle out the reason, but once I did, it was unmistakable. I was in love. It wasn't with one of the tigers in my compound. No, I had exhausted the possibilities of our small society long ago, and other than Saskia, there hadn't been any new arrivals in years. In fact, the object of my love wasn't another tiger at all. I was in love with my keeper, Kitch. I know it sounds strange, it kind of caught me by surprise too, but there really wasn't any avoiding the conclusion. 
and it was all the stranger because I had known Kitch for years. When I was a cub, he had been something like an assistant to my first keepers. He had thick hair then, and he was skinny and nervous. It was amusing to see him struggle to keep a clear path between himself and the compound door, in case he needed to make a quick escape. It's true what they say about us, we can smell fear, and that's why I noticed him. I was nervous around people then too, and his manner piqued my particular interest. Over the years other keepers came and went, tigers disappeared and new ones arrived, but Kitch was always there. He grew a moustache, his cheeks got round and his belly filled out. His hair went thinner and thinner every time he took off his cap. He shaved his moustache. He lost the wariness that I had once found so intriguing. His manner changed, his appearance changed, but he was always the same sweet kitsch. And that Wednesday I had woken up and realised. Kitch. I love Kitch. Realising I loved Kitch was like realising that a bone you have enjoyed chewing for months is actually the bone of your worst enemy. The bone hasn't changed, nor your enjoyment of it, but suddenly things are seen with a whole new perspective. Actually, that's a very negative example, but the point is this. I had just discovered a deep and endless love for the best friend I had ever had in my life. I should probably clarify, this wasn't the sort of love like when you see a hot new cat and can't keep your claws off her. I didn't love Kitsch like I had loved Saskia, not with the same, shall we say, roaring passion. This love wasn't as agitating. This was a different love. Every morning when the big metal doors opened in the fiberglass rock and pound after pound of cow meat and fresh organs came slithering down the passageway, Whose face was there in the dark distance, shovel in hand? Kitch's. When Maharaj growled and got restless and came looking for a fight, who was the first to hear his shrieky howls, to fire a water hose and scare him off me? Kitch. I was inexhaustibly interesting to him, and he was an inexhaustible curiosity and a comfort and joy to me. I think I'd call that love. And once I realised I loved Kitch, everything else in the world seemed to make so much perfect, indescribable, nonsensical sense. Saskia rejecting me. Fiberglass walls, lonely zoo-wandering old ladies, little children eating caramel corn, cockatoos and monkeys, and everything under the sun, so funny and strange, and I just loved it all. I had food and water and friends and kitsch. I really didn't need much more than this, did I? It's a little embarrassing even to think back on it. That was Wednesday morning. It didn't take long for things to take a turn for the worse. The first sign was when I walked to the fiberglass rock down which my food usually came slithering, leaving a trail of red, wet glisten. This morning I walked to the rock, looked up and waited. Nothing came. I sniffed and I waited. I closed my eyes and opened them. No food. I waited some more. And I waited. And I waited. I started to play a game. 
I would shut my eyes for a few moments at a time, and while my eyes were closed, I would convince myself that as soon as I opened them, the food would be there. I kept them closed for longer periods each time, but the food never arrived. Now I was very hungry, and when I'm hungry, my head hurts. In fact, it pounds. I shut my eyes firmly and tried to sleep it away, but the sun was quickly becoming unbearably hot. This was the middle of August, and I didn't want to go in search of shade, lest I miss the food when it finally came, and Maharaj, finished with his own meal, but greedy still, would come and pilfer it. So I lay down right there, under the sun, and tried to quiet the pounding in my head. By this time the people had started to arrive, not just a few early morning walkers, but thick hordes of people, huge summer vacation swarms, three or four deep, five or six herds of summer campers alone, plus tourists and regulars. Normally I don't mind the people who visit the zoo. They have their business, I have mine. They come, watch for a few minutes, point and stare, talk about me, eat their ice creams, whatever, I don't care. But today, there were so many of them, and they were so loud, and I was so hungry. My head was pounding, and I was just trying to relax, to stay calm and wait for my food. But they kept talking, and some little kid started to scream, Wake up! Wake up, tiger! Wake up! And then a whole chorus of kids joined him. Wake up, tiger! Wake up! I might have been able eventually to block them out and fall asleep, but right then I smelled Saskia, and that smell made me perk up. She was walking directly toward me, with that little sachet, that little walk of hers. I loved to contemplate the fluffy patch of white fur right beneath her tail, and the way her tail brushed over it lightly as she swayed from side to side to side. As I said, I was over her. I was totally fine with the idea of her together with Maharaj. Fucking Maharaj. But that didn't mean I had to stop appreciating her walk. And that didn't mean I was prohibited from inhaling a deep whiff of her gorgeous aroma as she ambled toward me. I purred to her very casually. Just a hello there, Saskia kind of purr. I waited for her to return the greeting, but she didn't even look at me. She walked past me like I wasn't even there. Now, this annoyed me, and it's one thing for her to sleep with Maharaj. That's her business and her prerogative. But to ignore me like that, as if we were no one to each other, that was too much. I felt a little stupid for having let myself get carried away with admiring her walk and everything, and just to show her that she had put me out of sorts, I snarled. It was a small snarl, accompanied by a little swat of my paw, a warning swat. There was no way I could have made contact, but when she saw me lift my paw, she jumped around and roared so loudly that I swear to God I almost pissed right where I stood. All right, I actually did piss. Then she walked away, as cool as could be. I could hear the school kids laughing at me now, but I ignored them and curled around and lay down again. Then I heard a familiar noise in the bushes, and I started to get nervous, because it was the sound of Maharaj. Maharaj is a massive beast of a cat. He has almost three times my bulk, so he makes a lot of noise when he moves. 
He must have heard Saskia's growl and was coming to check out the situation. Maharaj took his time, moving real slow, hefting his huge body through the brush, and I could smell him now. It was definitely Maharaj. So the fear and the pressure were kind of building up inside me. I was debating, should I try to get away and risk attracting his attention, or should I sit still and stay as quiet as possible and hope he'd ignore me? I decided to make a move for it, but this turned out to be the wrong decision. As soon as I got up and started to walk, I heard Maharaj break into a run, and in three quick bounds, boom, 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 his heavy body was on top of mine, and his claws were in my back, and his teeth were sunk deep into my ass. I screamed and writhed, but he kept me pinned down for thirty seconds or a minute, during which time I heard him fart, casual, loud and stinky, as if to demonstrate how relaxed he was, how little effort it took him to keep me locked down and in pain. Finally he released me, as calmly as you please. He got up and started to walk away. He didn't even look at me. Just like Saskia. He paused in front of the metal door in the fiberglass rock where I usually got my food. He crouched down and sent out a fat stream of piss. That smell would stick to that rock for days. And he knew it. At this point I was thinking, Kitch, I just want Kitch. I just want him to show up and salvage this day and restore it to its original promise. I want Kitch to bring me my food and wash my rock. I want Kitch to hang around for a few minutes and keep Maharaj away from me. I want to hear Kitch's voice flattering me and telling me what a good cat I was and telling me what to do. Actually, it would have been fine if Kitch didn't do any of these things. He could have forgotten the food and said not a word to me for all I cared. I just wanted him to be there. I just wanted to see his face for a few seconds. Just to look at him. In fact, even thinking about Kitch's pink face made me feel better gave me a feeling of hope and calm, and made the throbbing in my ass and my head fade a little. He would be here soon. I knew it. I settled down again and closed my eyes. The noise of the crowd also settled finally into a distant hum and chatter like it usually did, like a sonic blanket over the world and in a little while I managed to fall asleep. When I woke up it was grey and cool, a bank of clouds having moved in over the sun. My headache was better, but now my whole torso ached from hunger. I sniffed around the metal door, but there was still nothing there but the odour of Maharaja's cat piss. Kitch still hadn't arrived. I couldn't believe it. At that moment I heard a familiar noise wafting over the moat that separated me from the visitors. The river is chilly and the river is cold, hallelujah. Michael, row the boat ashore, hallelujah. Oh God, I thought. Not the row your boat, lady. Not today of all days. She sat down on the bench, sweated and stinking, hair astray, grinning with her broken teeth. I could smell her from where I sat. I roared at her instinctively, but she didn't shut up. In fact, she let out a whoop and a holler and sang all the louder. The river is deep and the river is wide, hallelujah. Milk and honey on the other side, hallelujah. 
I got up and paced back and forth, pausing every now and again to glare. But she wasn't intimidated in the least. She sang and she sang and she sang. After maybe half an hour, the singing faded into soft, incoherent chatter, until finally she slumped low on the bench and started to snore. Still the day dragged on, and the sun had barely even crested in the sky. I felt a painful knock, knock, knock in my head, and I looked up to see the teenage zoo attendant banging his litter stick against the bench, trying to rouse the row your boat lady. Finally she woke up and walked quietly away. Kitch, I kept thinking. Kitch, 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 kitch. And just then I saw Maharaj rising over the hill again, moving steady and fast, fairly bristling for another confrontation. What had I done this time? I kept repeating Kitch's name like a mantra. My head was about to explode into a million pieces. It hurt so bad I could barely move it from one side to the other, and Maharaj was moving in for the kill, ready to carve up my rump and shit on my lair for good measure. And just at that moment, just as the pressure in my head was reaching the point where my brains felt like they would liquefy and boil and shoot from my ears in jets of steam, just as Maharaj crouched down for the pounce, just as all these things were about to happen, the people door creaked open. And who was there but Kitch? It was really him his red face aglow in the sunlight, and I almost jumped into the air with delight. Maharaj turned and galloped away to hide. The pain in my head melted into some pink, loving bliss. Where was my hunger? Where was all the gloom and trouble of the day? It was all gone. Kitch was here. I paced back and forth and meowed like a lovesick lynx. I ran around in a circle and bit my tail. I peed in a long, hot stream with a big grin on my face. I paced up and down and up and down again, and then I rolled on my back and let my tongue loll out. And then I popped upright and roared. It was Kitch. Yes, Kitch was here. And I loved him. And he was here. Little did I know the most horrible thing was yet to happen. Kitch was still standing near the door. In fact, he seemed, for some reason, unnaturally cautious. He hadn't advanced towards me at all, nor had he called out to return my greetings. And that's when I realized there was someone with him. An older man with thick glasses and wearing white rubber gloves on his hands. Kitch began finally to walk to one side of me, slowly, while trying to shield this other nervous man from my view. Well, I had no time for this nonsense. Kitch was here, and I had something to tell him. I loved him, and my love couldn't contain itself, and I wanted to make Kitch feel it too. I pranced right up to Kitch, to just about three feet away from him, as close as I had ever been. I'm here, Kitch, I meant to say, and I love you. When I jumped forward like this, the man with glasses behind Kitch gripped Kitch's shoulder hard and said something I couldn't quite hear, and Kitch yelled at me sharply, and then Kitch did something I couldn't believe. He had a long stick in his hand. He always carried it, but I'd never seen him use it before. Now he raised this long stick high above his head and brought it down hard on my nose. 
I yowled and backed away, stunned. I couldn't at first understand what had happened. There was a sharp, reverberating pain between my eyes. The world before me seemed to split into two or three identical, sharp-edged versions of itself. Then everything became clouded in hazy splotches of red. Slowly my senses returned to me. I began to realise what had happened, that Kitch had actually hit me, that he had hit me hard in front of this new person. But why? What had I done? I had only been trying to show how much I loved him. Now I began to feel very bad. Not just the pain in my nose, but a different, difficult kind of anguish. Why would Kitch do a thing like that? Didn't he appreciate me? After I had wanted nothing more all day than to see that beautiful fat face and to love him, even though he had ignored me since yesterday, even though he had left me all alone and hadn't bothered even to feed me? All that love he could have had for the taking. But instead he'd gone and done a thing like this. He'd hit me. I was embarrassed and ashamed, and my ears began to run hot with blood. And then I began to feel angry. And all at once the anger welled up inside me, so sharp and fast, filling me like a hot liquid, and before I knew what was happening I took a huge leap and tackled Kitch. We fell down with a hard bang to the ground, my claws holding him fast, and in a way it felt good to hold him like that, a powerful kind of feeling. And then I bit him, just once, hard and quick. It happened so fast, and it wasn't at all intentional, at least I don't think it was intentional, it didn't feel intentional. To be honest, it didn't quite feel accidental either. It was somewhere in between. I was on him, and I bit him just once, and then I stepped away, all in the blink of an eye. The old man behind him screamed and retreated behind the people door, and then I blinked and looked down at where Kitch was lying. I had bitten him on the neck, and I saw there were two round black holes where my teeth had entered him, and now two thick streams of blood began to spout out of those two holes. Kitch was staring at me with a concerned look. His mouth was moving up and down, and now blood was coming out of his mouth as well. Just a few seconds ago, Kitch was standing up and healthy, and I had been so happy to see him. And now he was lying on the ground with blood spilling out of his mouth because of something I had done. This hadn't happened. This couldn't be happening. I had never hurt anyone in all my life. I didn't even know I had the power to take a man down so deftly. The blood was spreading black and wet around him. Now I knew I had to put a stop to this. I had to reverse whatever this was that had happened. I ran up to Kitch and I saw that he was scared of me now. I licked his neck from where the blood was coming and tried to make the blood stop. Kitch feebly pushed and tried to kick at me, but I ignored him and kept licking. I licked and I licked, but the blood kept pouring out, so I licked faster. And as I licked, for what seemed like minutes, I slowly became conscious of the fact that there was no way my licking was going to stop this blood from pouring out. And yet, I couldn't stop licking. I didn't want to stop licking, because another surprising realization was forming in the back of my mind, something that had never even remotely occurred to me before. A realization that made me want to lick and lick faster and keep licking forever. 
the realization was. Kitch's blood was delicious. As soon as this thought formed itself in my mind, I jumped back in horror. This was Kitch's blood I was drinking. Kitch, whom I loved. What was I doing? I turned around to look for help. Saskia and Maharaj were standing at a distance, staring with eager curiosity, but neither of them made the slightest move to help me. I knew they were too cautious to get involved, and I couldn't be bothered to convince them. I looked then to the other side of the moat, where dozens and dozens of people were staring at us and talking and pointing in alarm. One of these people could surely help Kitch, I thought. I ran up and down and roared and tried to get their attention, but none of them made the first effort to cross the moat and help us. In fact, some of them started to throw things at me, paper cups full of soda, little rocks, and to yell. To hell with them, I thought. When I turned back around to check on Kitch, I saw that the old man with glasses had crouched down and was trying to do something to my friend. Was the old man helping? Was someone helping at last? I ran back to check, but as soon as I did so, the old man fell backward and scrambled hurriedly out of the people door, leaving that door swinging wildly behind him. Poor Kitch! Nobody would help him. His eyes were open and he was pale. The blood from his neck had slowed to a trickle and the ground around him was soggy like a three-day rain. His lips were moving so slightly and then they stopped moving and his eyes just stared up. I licked his sweet face but he didn't respond. Oh, Kitch, what had I done? I had to find help for him if it was the last thing I did. I turned and ran out of the people door. I had never been outside the people door before, but I didn't even think twice about running out of it. There were hundreds of people outside, literally hundreds. But why wouldn't any of them stop to help me? They all ran away as if terribly frightened of something everywhere I looked. What mysterious terror could have overtaken the zoo's entire human population on this day of all days? What could be so horrible that it would keep them from helping Kitch? Had an elephant escaped? The situation finally became clear to me. I was Kitch's only hope. I ran back to the door of my compound, but as soon as I got there I saw a bright flash and heard a blast. When the smoke cleared and my ears stopped ringing, I saw that a tall, thin man had kneeled down very quietly behind the popcorn stand across from my compound. He held a long gun in his hands. He had been waiting for me, apparently, and now he fired again. I crouched down and stayed very still. He fired a third time, and I heard a loud crash behind me. I tried to lunge toward him, but then he fired once more, and the blast came so close that my face burned with its heat, and I had no choice but to turn around and run. I ran, and I ran, and the people around me screamed and ran too, and I ran behind these people, and then I ran alongside them, having nowhere else to go, and finally I ran away from them. I kept running until I had no idea where I was any more. There were no animals and no people, just a long ribbon of black with objects rushing by, things on wheels that groaned and squawked and growled. Every few minutes I heard, or thought I heard, the crash and fire of the tall man's rifle that had almost burned me moments earlier, and then I ran even harder. I ran alongside those fast-rolling things, and they swerved and smashed and croaked and honked. I kept running and running, not sure where I was headed, just desperate to get away from the madness at the zoo, the madness that was my life, and hoping still to find some help, somehow, 
for Kitch. I ran until I could barely pick up my legs any longer, and each breath raked my lungs with sharpened claws. I slowed down and looked around me, and saw that the rolling objects had grown finally, sparse and distant. I saw wide grassy expanses, with small houses set back nicely on the neat grass. Everywhere I looked, houses and grass, nicely spaced, as far as the eye could see, and this vista, the longest vista I could remember ever having seen, stirred me with a strange exhilaration. I could run as long and as far as I wanted here, with no wall to stop me. And I did run. As tired as I was, something in my heart stirred me to run again in great leaping strides. It was a strange feeling to be on the run, to be worried about Kitch whom I had hurt, to be away from the only home I had known, and yet to feel this strange and almost terrifying euphoria. On one of these great lawns behind a small house, I was gratified to see a huge ice-blue pool of water. I stopped here and drank as much as I could hold. Then I put my very head into the pool and lifted it out, sopping and cool. And now the pull of sleep was overwhelming. So I sank down where I was and closed my eyes. But the sleep was brief and fitful. On the backs of my eyelids I saw again the image of Kitch bleeding and struggling on the ground. I saw the man with thick glasses and rubber gloves reaching those gloved hands toward me. I saw Maharaj and Saskia staring at all this with strange glee on their faces. Finally, I heard the soft steps of the man with the rifle and heard the sharp lightning of his gun, and I woke with a start. Was he really nearby, or had that been part of the dream? The wide-open vista which a few moments before had brought me a feeling of elation now seemed fraught with danger. I was too exposed here. That quiet man with his long gun was probably this moment lining me up in his sights. The pool where I had drunk sat right behind a small house or building. I crept up to it and sniffed for any danger. It was hard to smell anything in this place. But an odour of humans seemed to linger in the air, like it did at the zoo, wafting from a distance, and this smell reminded me of the comfort of my home. I pushed and shoved at the glassy doors of the building until I found an access that gave at my pressure, and quietly I stepped inside. The house was shadowy and silent and walking on the soft furry floors I came to a cave-like room, dark and quiet and cool, and here, for the first time, I fell asleep and slept so that I forgot myself, for a short time at least. I woke up well rested and eager to resume searching out some help for Kitch, but when I opened my eyes I saw that the room was brightly lit, not dark as it had been earlier. There were coloured pictures on the wall, red-nosed clowns carrying motley balloons, just like I had seen some days in the zoo. On one side of the room was an open-topped cage, raised on small stilts, and from inside the cage came the strangely calming sounds of a murmuring human cub. Again, another sound I was well used to hearing in my home. But before I noticed any of these things, of course, I noticed the woman standing across the room from me. She was a full-grown human with brown curly hair and pink skin, like Kitch's skin. 
Her back was against the wall, and she was inching toward the cub's cage with small, sideways steps. I lifted my head from my paws, my nose quivering with excitement, my ears and the hair on my back rigid with attention. When she saw me perk up, the woman paused where she was standing and took a sharp breath inward. Her arms were spread behind her, and her fingers were splayed backward with their tips resting against the wall. She seemed to force herself to breathe again with great trembling deliberation. Finally she released the wall and began to walk once more, slowly, toward the cage. A cat has an instinct for such situations, and my instinct quickly told me this woman was mother to the crying cub. Normally I would have thought that she'd be a threat to me only in so far as she would try to protect her young, but my recent experiences had warned me that humans were dangerously unpredictable, and I had better be careful of her regardless. I rose and stepped very slowly in a direction opposite to the direction that the woman was walking in. That is, I walked away from the cub's cage, and the woman stalked carefully toward her cub, and like that we circled the room warily. The baby human was murmuring in the softest, most innocent way, and in fact I wanted this mother to take it and care for it, like most cats in the zoo, I considered myself an orphan. Where I came from, who my mother was, I have no recollection. But as I walked that strange duet with this cautious human mother, I had a brief and visceral flash of an older female tiger, a warm and orange-coloured softness, a light and muscular embrace. I felt my legs quiver beneath me, and then I had another brief flash of memory, a strong blow to the face, like the blow that Kitch had given me, a fast run through the brush, a panic of voices. Now I felt dizzy with strange emotion, and that human woman must have sensed my unsteadiness. She took the opportunity to move quickly toward her own cub, and with arms shaking terribly, she reached inside and pulled out the gurgling thing. Her sudden movement brought me back to my senses. I turned swiftly to keep a track on her actions, and when she saw me move like that, the woman let out a terrifying shriek, and in her panic she allowed her little one to slip right from out of her hands. What happened next happened so quickly I can barely describe it. I saw the fleshy child tumble toward the ground, and in one instinctive urge I lunged toward it. The next thing I knew the tiny human dangled upside down and crying from my mouth. I held it only by the crinkled piece of cloth it wore around its bottom. The mother stood a few feet away from me, and she cried out now even more uncontrollably than her cub did, and her cheeks were flushed bright red. I had never seen a human so upset before. I had no idea how she would behave now. I started to move forward, thinking I would return her offspring to her, but as soon as I lifted my paw to move, she yelled and quivered more alarmingly than before, so I stepped back again. Now I really didn't know what to do. I couldn't move in either direction without sending the woman into further hysterics. I just stood there, blankly. When it began to seem that our terrible, nervous stalemate might last forever, this woman ended it in a totally surprising way. She slowly bent down and picked up a couple of wooden blocks, baby's toys. She got up and flung them at me hard. The blocks hit me squarely on the flank, and I backed off into a crouch. The woman seemed to gain her courage back when she saw me cower. She started to pick up anything she could get her hands on, plastic things on wheels, blocks of many colours, soft and furry shapes resembling bears and lions and people, and she rained these objects on me in a continuous angry hail. 
As soon as I got over my surprise, I began to realize that as hard as she threw these objects, they didn't really hurt me, and more often than not, they hit wide of their mark anyway. Frankly, I was more concerned that with her wild arm she would hit her own cub, and in fact this happened. Even as I tried to curl around and protect it, a high-flying train flew over my head and bounced off the piss-wet leg of the little one. Now I was thoroughly annoyed. I let the cub drop onto the pillowy floor and turned around and roared at the mother with all the might of my hot and humid lungs. Then I stepped toward her and roared again as loud as I was able to. As I said, humans are so unpredictable. As soon as I roared like this, the curly-haired lady collapsed as instantly and softly as a pile of feathers from a startled bird. She fell to the ground in a dead faint. After a few seconds I gathered the courage to approach her inert body. I bent down, sniffed her, licked her face. But she didn't wake up. Now what was I to do? The cub had begun roaring, wailing and crying, rolling this way and that on the floor. It didn't seem right to leave it there so helpless, with its mother lying unconscious. I went back to the little one and sniffed it. I had thought that Maharaj was an ugly smelling beast, but this human cub smelled terrible. I licked its pudgy, salty face, but this had no comforting effect. Finally I picked it up again by its soiled cloth. I pushed my way back out the door through which I had entered the house. I went to the ice-blue pool where I had enjoyed such a refreshing drink a few hours previously, and I held the baby human's face to the cool water, thinking perhaps it was thirsty. But it didn't reach for the water. In fact, it seemed a little frightened of it, so I took the liberty of dipping its face into the liquid ever so gently. But now the little thing coughed and spat and began crying all the louder. With this loud crying, my pounding headache from earlier that morning began to creep back. I also worried that the loud noise would draw the attention of people in the neighbouring buildings, or of the man with the rifle, who I was sure even then was stalking me. I thought to leave the little one there and run away, but I couldn't bear the thought of this helpless, undefended, motherless cub in the open. Really, something had to be done, and quickly, to quiet this confounding little human. I admit I don't have the instincts of a mother and for a long time I had no idea what to do. Then I had a stroke of inspiration. I laid the cub down softly on the grassy lawn. I opened my mouth wide and took its whole head gently inside my own mouth. And in this way I picked it up again. There, the sound of the cub's crying was considerably muffled. My mouth also provided a kind of warm and comforting womb for it, and soon, in fact, the flailing arms and legs of the little one stopped moving. The cries in my mouth softened into comforted whimpers, then finally into silence as it drifted to sleep. Only when I released the cub's head and laid him gently out on the grass again did I realize what I had done. Yes, the baby human had stopped crying, but it had stopped breathing, too. I had stupidly, inadvertently, recklessly suffocated it. Oh, God! I picked it up and shook it left and right. I dropped it down and roared at it, and then picked it up and swung it about some more, hoping somehow to wake it. By the time I finished, the cub was no more alive than it had been when I started, but its body was considerably worse for wear, with the little rips here and there, dislocated joints, bruises spreading like lakes, and puncture marks everywhere. Most upsettingly for me, in its right eye, which dribbled a 
colourful syrup. I felt sick to my stomach. How did I keep doing this time after time, killing people unintentionally? What was wrong with me? Was I evil? I picked the human up again by its filthy cloth, this limp little human whose head I had crushed, and carried it away with me, dangling from my teeth. Now I had two people to fix, and at least I was comforted by this notion. If I could find someone to help me fix this cub, who was light and easy to carry, then I would know there was hope for Kitch. And yes, I couldn't help but taste the blood of this human. It tasted even sweeter than Kitch's blood. But even though I had eaten nothing for a full day, the thought never crossed my mind to eat this child. To be precise, it crossed my mind once, but I quickly put the sick notion out of my head. I walked through the streets of that place, dangling that dead, dripping human baby before me like the night watchman in the zoo carried a lamp in the dark, and I saw no other creature. There was no one who could help. I must have walked another quarter day until I reached a vast sea of resting vehicles and a large building that was thronged with people. I walked toward this throng and again people screamed and ran away from me. But I was so inured by now to this reaction that I simply ignored it. I was looking for that one person who would see me and stop and know what to do, that person who would know how to help this cub and to help me and to help my friend. My love. Kitch. I pushed my way into the building and people yelled and ran away from me in every direction, but I calmly walked forward. People carried bags of clothes, of toys, of devices and things, and they dropped and flung these bags everywhere as they saw me. But I simply and calmly walked. When I reached the other end of the building, I stepped outside again into the sunlight. No one had helped me. And I wondered, really, did nobody care for a dead baby? Was there nobody in this world who cared? By this point, the sun was sinking low in the sky, and I was depressed. I just wanted to lie down and forget everything. I wanted to unwind this day and let it disappear into nothing. I found my way across another avenue. The vehicle screeched and crashed and almost hit me, but I didn't care and I found a quiet corner beneath a large bridge or overpass. Above me I could hear those fast rolling things, but down here it was dark and cool and quiet. I set the human cup carefully down, and I lay down beside it. Far in the distance I heard those wild howling sirens. The objects whooshed and whooshed overhead, and the bridge shivered and clanked with their weight. From somewhere in the sky came the cluttered drone of objects flying, and every sound in this world seemed ugly and new. In the distance I thought I heard the loud report of a rifle, and I knew that the orange fire of that gun was near in my future. I wanted nothing else but to be back in my enclosure, and for the baby to be alive, and for Kitch to be okay again. But I knew it would never happen. I had been kidding myself. Nothing in the world could bring Kitch back to life. Certain things can never be reversed. It would simply never happen. I thought of Kitch's pudgy face as it was a few days ago, bright and pink beneath his khaki cap, and a smile settled on my face. I remembered the cooing noises of the row your boat lady singing her sad song. It had annoyed me so, but now that noise seemed so lovely. My brothers and sisters are all aboard, 
hallelujah. Michael, row the boat ashore, hallelujah. And the noise was so close and so real that I thought she could have been right there beside me, singing. And when I looked up, she was. It would have surprised me to see her there on any other day. But this day, nothing surprised me any more. She was sitting beneath the same bridge as I was, amid a nest of bags and garbage. She looked at me and sang smiling through her broken teeth. Then she got up and walked right up to me. You came all the way here to see me, Tiger, she asked me. I was too tired to get up, but I raised my head slightly. I was so happy to see her that tears were streaming from my eyes. She saw the human baby lying next to me, and she shook her head. Oh, Tiger, she said. Oh, that's a shame. She bent down and stroked the top of the cub's head. Ming the Merciless, she whooped. And then she started to chuckle to herself. And that laugh was the strangest, sweetest sound I think I had ever heard. I closed my eyes and saw the zoo and its miniature red-green forest and it was full of tigers just like me. And Saskia and Maharaj were there, and I had forgiven them, and I ran and I played with them. And the baby's curly-haired mother stood nearby, and she was my mother, too. She had been my mother all along. And in my dream I had my own kids, baby tigers, playful little cubs, as small as I had been once, just as small as the human baby I had killed. The tiger babies tumbled over each other clumsily, so cute. I tried to lick them and play with them, but I saw that my tongue and my paws were too rough and too powerful, and the slightest Touch would have damaged those babies, so I stopped playing, and instead I stood guard and watched over them. On the other side of the moat, Kitch and great hordes of humans watched and admired. And then, one by one, they started to climb over the wall and wade through the moat, so eager were they to reach us. Soon, great armies of people were crossing over into the tiger compound, and they came running up my hill. There were so many of them that I couldn't protect my delicate babies from their heavy feet. They trampled right over my cubs, mashing them down in their oblivious rush, and the strange old man with thick glasses and rubber gloves came around and picked up my dead babies and dropped them into a plastic bag. And I was distraught. But then Kitch came to me. He stopped and patted me on the head and scratched me behind the ear. He told me it was okay. He said the tiger babies were gone and it was okay. And he was gone and that was okay too. And I realized that as he petted me, he was beginning to crush my head, like wet sludge in his hand. His fingers were deep in my brain, and he was massaging it into a pulp, and it felt good in a way, but it terrified me also, because I knew I would soon be lost in oblivion. When I woke up, it was dark. I had the aching hunger that stretched my ribs. The droning noise from the sky was harder and closer, and I knew soon I would have to get up and keep moving to stay out of the reach of the rifles. But at that second, this thought didn't bother me. I had that morning feeling again, that feeling I had when I first realized that I loved Kitch and the world had made a brief and wonderful kind of sense. 
everything seemed so clear again. Everything that was horrible was sensible, and everything was good, and I understood it all. I looked down and saw that the row your boat lady had fallen asleep with her head resting on top of me. She was curled into a ball with her head nestled right up against my haunches, as peaceful as could be, and I thought, she is a wonderful person. I love you, row your boat lady, I said to myself as I opened my mouth wide and worked my teeth into her soft stomach and pulled up her viscera. She gasped just once, without even opening her eyes, sharp and sudden, like she had just had a wonderful surprise. And then she stopped, never exhaling. It felt so right, killing her like that. It moved me. I didn't do it from anger or from hunger, nor was it an act of recklessness like with that poor little human baby. A word that comes to mind is instinct. And yet I know that I chose to kill her. I chose to kill her, and it felt inevitable, and it made me sad and happy all at once. I set myself to work, and when I had ripped out and eaten every organ and every sweet strip of flesh that I could peel from the row your boat lady, when I had sucked down even the soft rounds of meat in the cheeks of her face, when she was just a shiny hub of bone and muscle, I turned around and picked up the human cup. It took me just two bites to crunch and pop and slurp and swallow the whole thing, and I was crying as I did so. I had never felt so much love in all my life. The infamous Bengal Ming if you enjoyed listening to the infamous Bengal Ming by Rajesh Parameswaran, please look for the full collection titled I Am an Executioner, published in paperback and ebook by Vintage Books and published as an audiobook by Dreamscape, narrated by Lena Patel and Neil Shah. If you would like to find out more about Mr. Parameswaran and his work, please visit our website, nocturnaltransmissions.com.au. All non-public domain stories are featured with the permission of the authors. All voices and production are concocted by Kristen Holland. This episode was brought to you with the generous assistance of our cohorts Sam Bell, Robert Troy Peterson, Evan Dooley, Michael Wood, and Sanitarium Magazine. Sanitarium is an independent magazine dedicated to bringing audiences the best in horror from around the globe. Available from Amazon and SanitariumPublishing.com if you wish to support our humble production, you may do so by subscribing, sharing us with your friends, becoming a Nocturnal Transmissions patron at patreon.com, and of course, simply continuing to lend us your ears, as the bard would put it. Until next time, watch the skies, fear the dark, and don't trust anyone, especially yourself. Good night, gentle listener.